Right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to a new week. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, so could any one of us please lead us in prayer? Kennedy. Let's pray. Yeah. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this opportunity that you've given to us to come and study your word. We thank you for our teacher, Teacher Emmanuel. We pray God that will give him the wisdom and the guidance to dispense. Thank you for using him as a vessel to teach us the truth and the knowledge about you. And that Jehovah will commit all the students in thy hands. We pray against anything that is going to disrupt our studies, Father Jehovah. Pray and trust in the mighty name of us and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, uh, Kennedy, for leading us in prayer. All right. Before we go ahead, let's just look at a quick review of what we did last week. Uh, last week, we did 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we covered some of the important points. Paul says, uh, I came to you in wisdom, not of the wisdom of the world, but the wisdom of the spirit right and he says uh, in the first few verses of that chapter he says i came to you in fear and in trembling uh, not with you know persuasive words which means not words of uh, intellect on uh, high knowledge but he said he came with fear and trembling and he came with a demonstration of the power of the holy spirit Right. Then he goes on in chapter two, talking about the wisdom that we have in the spirit. Uh, we we saw that uh, you know uh, he reveals how the Holy Spirit reveals the purposes and the plans of God uh, to people. And uh, we completed in chapter two, so we'll move into chapter three now. Let me see if I can just put the notes up before we start. Yeah, chapter three. Right, so in chapter 3, Paul now, he's turning his attention to the first issue of the Corinthian church, right? Uh, now, we know that there were plenty of problems, right? Uh, but one of the most important or radical problem in the church was the whole point of division, right? One is saying Apollos, one is saying Paul, one is saying Cephas. So he gets to the root of the problem right uh, so let's begin from here uh, chapter 3 was 1 to 4 right so we'll just begin from there and I brethren could not speak to you as spiritual people but as as to carnal as to babes in Christ I fed you with milk and not with solid food for until now you were not able to receive it and even now you are still not able, right? Verse 3, for you are still carnal, for where there is envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am Paul, another says, I am Apollos, are you not carnal? Now, we see that Paul is not wasting any time. Chapter 1, chapter 2, he tells the believers, hey, this is your standing in Christ, right? He calls them dearly beloved. Uh, he, he is ex exhorting them. He's letting them know their identity. But in chapter 3, he begins and he says, hey, you have the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You are speaking in tongues. There's, uh, you know, the, the entire church is flowing in the gifts of the Spirit. But Paul here, in verse 3, he says, are you still not carnal? Right? So this is really strong words for believers who are hearing it, right? Paul is saying, are you still not carnal? You, uh, what is the meaning of carnal? The word carnal means to be ruled by the flesh or sense ruled. Right? Uh, uh, in the sense, you know, doing things out of the flesh is nothing but carnal. Right? Now, we know that the, you know, the Holy Spirit was actively functioning in the church in Corinth, uh, the gifts of the Spirit. He says uh, later on in the later chapters, he says, um, you know, I, I like, you know, I'm, I'm glad that you all are speaking in tongues and there's all these gifts. Uh, 
but you all are still carnal right now he goes on to say that is why i'm feeding you with milk and not with solid food now doesn't mean that paul is really feeding them milk it only means that uh in terms of the christian faith in terms of his teachings right he's just giving them the basics right it's like just you know he's trying to let the church know see you all may be puffed up with all your gifts and all of that but you all are still carnal now this is very important for us as believers right i'm going to say this right our gifts and our anointing which god places in our life is not a sign of spiritual maturity right so i'm going to repeat that our gifts and our anointing that the holy spirit bestows upon us is not a sign of maturity right just because somebody can prophesy just because somebody can speak in tongues or uh, maybe somebody has the working of miracles does not mean they are matured right uh god has given that to us the holy spirit has bestowed it upon us but if we are still living life in strife in jealousy envy you know competition hatred to one another it is nothing but we are living a carnal life which is a life of immaturity right so these are strong words paul is just hitting the nail on the head he's saying see all this is good it's wonderful to flow in the gifts but you all are still carnal you are ruled by the flesh right and when we say spiritual right uh, if we conduct ourselves as spiritual that means spirit led spirit empowered we become mature believers right so look at this picture you can have a person who is you know speaking in tongues prophetic word of knowledge healing and miracle working of healing and miracles greatly anointed by god but you can have him still being immature and carnal whereas you can have another believer who is you know maybe not flowing in the gifts of the spirit at all but highly matured in christ living a life that is pleasing to god's eyes right so which one should we choose we must choose to of course walk in the holy spirit right walk in the gifts but also walk in maturity right that means don't walk in the carnal in the flesh right saying that you know uh, now it could happen to any one of us if we are bitter against somebody and we cannot forgive that person we are acting carnal right? now is the gifts of the holy spirit inside us yes is the anointing there yes but we still hate the other person right so we must be careful then he goes on verse 5 says who then is paul and who is apollos but ministers through whom you believed as the lord gave to each one i planted apollos waters but god gave the increase verse seven so then neither who plants is anything nor he who waters but god who gives the increase now he who plants and he who waters are one and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor right let me stop there now i'm sure many a times we've heard this right uh, you know uh, one plants one waters but god makes it grow that right? many a times we've heard this right and uh, this is the best example of how you and i as believers must relate to each other as well as ministries how they must relate to each other now in a world that we're living in and when we look at uh, christendom all across the globe um, we have different kinds of ministries right uh, we have the prophetic ministry we have the apostolic ministry the uh, you know evangelistic ministry the uh, healing ministry so so many ministries around us now this is a good example to follow because it's very easy to come to a place of competition strife and comparison 
right? I can I can come to a place and say, hey, but mine is a prophetic ministry, so mine is better than you know yours. My, we may not say it, but if we think it, it's already being carnal, right? Now Paul is clarifying certain things here, right? And this entire portion here, he's clarifying, and I've, I've marked it there, right? Uh, first one, he says, all of us of are ministers of God. And the Lord has appointed each one his assignment. So if God has called you to maybe prophetic or evangelistic ministry, it is God's appointment on us. Right? It's not our choice. God has appointed that for us. So verse 5, he's saying, who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? Now we know that Paul was apostolic, apostolic in nature. He would always go out. He's a pioneer, right? Uh, so he would go out to different places. Apollos was more of a teacher, right? He was a wonderful teacher, wonderful orator. Now both had different ministries, but both were appointed by God. So what is Paul trying to say? Who are they? They are nothing but people whom God has chosen to advance God's kingdom, right? So he goes on, verse 6, some plant, some water, but God gives the increase, right? So all growth, all fruit comes from God, right? I've always used this example. Imagine I give you five seeds, right? Maybe apple or mango seeds. Say, so, okay, go into the garden, put it into the ground. So you put it into the ground, you put it on fertile soil, right? And then you have somebody who keeps watering it. Now, what happens if it doesn't grow? Are we 100% sure that our, all the five seeds will grow into five apple or mango plants? We're not sure, right? Because it is God. Now, of course, we have to do the practical things of putting it into fertile ground, watering it, making sure that it's looked after. This gets the you know the plant or the seed gets appropriate sunlight and uh, all of those things. But it is God who brings the fruit. Now, when we walk in this mindset, the way we do ministry will change. Right? So we can say, God, I'm just putting the seed into this person's heart. Maybe somebody else will water it. But Lord, you make it grow. You make it come. Let fruit come from their, from his or her life. So there's no place of pride. There's no place of saying, hey, because I shared the gospel with him, he's become a believer. Or because I started this ministry and now the ministry is so big because I came in. Right? So the whole thing of I is removed in this in this one verse. Because neither he who plants nor he who waters, but it is God who gives the increase. Right? So we do not exalt who plants, we don't exalt who waters. We exalt God. We say, God, thank you for doing this. Thank you for the increase. Thank you for the fruit. And as ministers, we are to work together in this. Right. Now it's very sad to see around us, you know, uh, there, there's so much of strife and division within the church, right? And, and that must not be so, right? Because if if it is so, then what is Paul saying? We are carnal, right? Yeah, but God, I'm a pastor for 15 years. No, you're still carnal. Why? Because there's division. You're not able to grasp the things of God still being immature right so these are strong words now each minister verse 8 right we did each minister will receive their reward from the master according to what he has done right now this is an encouragement for us right uh, but it's also a reminder to us right so whatever work that we do whatever work that has been assigned to us as ministers of God, our reward comes from God. Right? Yes, there will be times when, you know, in the ministry, when we do well, people see the fruit, God will bless us. Even people, uh, you know, leaders will 
you know, bless us and they'll appreciate our work. But true reward comes from God. It could be somebody who's coming to church and just wiping the chairs Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Nobody knows it. Right? But church people come, they sit in the church and they go off. Nobody acknowledges, nobody, no, nobody in the church, the pastor is not going to say, oh, let's give a clap to this person because he wiped all the chairs in the morning. Nobody's going to do that. <clears throat> but your reward is from the master. Right? Uh, God is going to reward that. God is not going to overlook even the smallest task you have done for his kingdom. Right? So isn't that an encouragement? So it's not always, you know, going on the pulpit preaching, and you know, uh, uh, or worship leader, and you know, leading the worship. It's good. God has given us those uh, gifts and call. That's good. But be willing to do even the smallest of tasks because your reward is from the Master. And then he goes on, uh, verse nine. Let's read verse nine and ten. For we are God's fellow workers. And you are God's field, you are God's building. Verse 10, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. Right. So verse 9, he's saying all of us are God's co-workers. We are co-workers with God. Now, just because I am teaching here, does not mean that you know I am in a higher level than you. No, right? We all are co-workers with God, right? You, you can do something more than what I can do, right? So we must understand that you know we're, we're all working together to build God's kingdom, right? And then He says, "God's people are the field." So. Uh, you know, he wants them to be nurtured. He wants them to be watered. And God's people are his building. Right? So so what is this? What, what, what can we understand from this? All true ministry is about nurturing and building up God's people. Remember the book of, uh, I think it's Colossians, where... Paul says to the believers there, he says, you are my crown in heaven. You are my rejoicing. What is my rejoicing? You, you people. When I see you all in heaven, that is the rejoicing. I'm not going to rejoice in the works that I have done, but my rejoicing is that you are living a carnal life. You are living in sin, but God brought you out. And God gave me the opportunity to sow into your life, to nurture you, to water you, and to build you as God's people. And so that is my rejoicing. Right? So, so imagine this. You and I, if we are ministering to one person and maybe just encouraging that person or building that person in the faith, what you're doing is you're watering and nurturing God's field. Right? Now you may think, okay, one person, no, the field is so big, one person, no, that's okay. One person is as much as important as a thousand people. Right? Remember what Jesus did in the parable of the lost sheep? What did he do? He went, one sheep was went away, ran away, it was lost. He left the 99 and he went for that one. So there may be a million people right, around, but if there's one person that you are ministering to, that one person counts. right? So as we serve God, our heart must be set on nurturing and building God's people. Right? The moment my focus in ministry changes to, oh, I wish, uh, you know, no, uh, we had a better sound system, or I wish we had a better production team, or I wish, you know, all these other things, which are important, right? It's good. God wants us to have all of this. But our main focus should be people. That ministry is about people, right? So our focus should be towards that. 
We see ourselves as God's co-workers, right? Then whether we get prominence or we don't get prominence, that doesn't matter. Right? You can be in children's church. You can be in teen church. You can be a parking, helping in the parking. You can be serving coffee after church. You can just be somebody who's you know welcoming people into the church. It's small as you could be somebody who's standing near the restrooms and leading people to the restroom if they want to use it. Now the task doesn't look very interesting or very uh, you know encouraging on a Sunday morning. <clears throat> but if you're doing this to help God's kingdom, you're co-working with people, you're building God's kingdom. Your, your reward is in heaven. The master, the Lord Jesus, will reward you for that. Will people reward you? May not be. But God will reward you. Right? Uh, now, each one of us have a grace in our life. Right? We, it's just a side note. Each one of us have a grace in our life, right? So, for example, when we look at people in this world, like right? well, let me think of an example. Yeah, Mother Teresa, right? God gave her the grace that she must, you know, be with the lepers, right? No, not everyone can do this, right? It is it is a special grace. She pressed in for more, and she was able to do it, right? So all of us have a certain grace, right? Some of them. May have a grace in, in you know, just talking to the uh, to those who are in difficult situation, right? Um, oh, maybe it is uh, somebody has a grace to be a wonderful parent. They just know how to you know be a good parent, a good father, right? Or somebody else, he just he or she just knows how to you know uh, teach the children. They, their life, they know they are called for children's ministry. Right? So every one of us have a certain grace, and we must press on for more of that. But Paul here, he's saying, he's recognizing the grace God has given him. He's saying in verse, um, verse is, as a master builder, he says, yeah, verse 10, he says, right, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder. I like the way he starts verse 10. He says, according to the grace of God. So it was not Paul's, you know, uh, he was excited to travel to places. Not so. Right? Uh, he had a choice. He could have, he's about 50 years old. He could have been, you know, doing his tent work and shared the gospel there near Tarsus and been happy. But he says, but the grace of God, by the grace of God, he was a master builder, wise master builder, which means he he lays the foundation of the work of God. He was he he was a pioneer in 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 you know starting so many churches. Right. And we look at it, right? His first missionary journey, uh, when he went into Galatia, he, you know, he, churches were just planted. His second missionary journey, churches were just planted. Right? He just was able to do it. Now, can everyone do that? No. It is the grace of God for him. Wherever he went, he planted churches. Now, if we read the book of Acts, I'm sure there are plenty of other churches which have started, which he started, but he's not written a letter to them. right? Uh, so he says, as a wise master builder, I laid the foundation. But whoever builds on it must be wise how to build on it, how to build on this foundation. So to the readers, Apostle Paul is, you know, think, just picture this. You are sitting in Corinth and they are reading this to you. And he's saying, now I laid the foundation to that church. We must be wise on how to build on it. Now looking at what's happening, Things are not going right. You're building, the foundation is good because I came, I shared the gospel. You became true believers. But you're building on good foundation. You're building, you know, probably sand or you're building just clay, which is going to melt away when it rains. It's just going to demolish. It's not strong enough. Why? Because you're building 
on you know the carnal things right uh, the foundation is good i assure you, uh, you know, paul is saying i as a wise master builder i've built a good foundation but you have to be wise how to build on it now this is a very very important point that we must understand in ministry right uh, even as you're here studying preparing yourself god may call you to pioneer something or maybe even to build on something that somebody has already pioneered right now we must be careful how we build on it right and then he talks about building material this is very interesting and i uh, i really every now and then i come to this verse so that you know uh, i get an understanding you know what is ministry all about right so build with the right materials let's look at that uh, right feel free to ask any questions if you have any questions uh you can just post it on the chat and uh, or you can also unmute and ask your questions right okay all right so build with right materials so now paul is saying the foundation is done you're going to build let me tell you what to build how to build what is the material that you must use right so verse 11 onwards for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid which is jesus christ now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold silver precious stones wood hay straw each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is right verse 14 if anyone's work which has been built which he has built on it endures he will receive a reward if anyone's work is burned he will suffer loss but he himself will be saved yet so as through fire now this is very very interesting how paul is you know just bringing out the entirety like whatever he's thinking of he's put it as a picture to the readers what a brilliant way of writing an epistle he says there's one foundation jesus christ and on that foundation i am standing on it and we have built this church right now we must be careful how we build and he goes on to say it is possible that you know if we see here the things that he says you can build with gold silver and precious stones right and then there is wood hay and straw so three gold silver precious stones wood hay and straw now he says there it will be revealed by fire now what will happen to gold silver and precious stones when you put it into the fire nothing it does not lo lose its value gold melts the value remains the same it actually even purifies silver put it in fire it melts the value remains the same precious stones values remain the same now what about wood hay and straw what will happen if fire comes on it it's going to become ashes and i always picture it this way right wood hay and straw is big you can see it right it's very easily noticeable that right? you don't have a big pile of gold right you have little gold right because it's very expensive it's very precious but you can have a big pile of wood or hay and straw and all of it so when people look at it oh so big so wonderful but when the fire comes it'll all become ashes so what is the understanding that we must gain from this don't look at people's work and judge them or judge their ministry oh this ministry is really great or this person has done achieved so much now it could be wood hay, could be they're building on wood hay and straw if they are not then that's good right it is possible to do the right things out of the wrong motives right i'm going to repeat that it's possible to do the right things in the wrong motives right 
now if you look at the uh, in philippians uh you know there were people who shared the gospel right remember he says there are some some who are sharing the gospel out of uh uh, sorry, I think it's Book of Acts. It says there are some who are sharing the gospel out of strife and envy. Right now, they, is sharing the gospel good? Very good. It's the right thing to do, but the motive is wrong. If I want to become a worship leader, and my intention is God, I want people to experience Your presence when. I lead worship or help me to take them to your presence. That's the responsibility of a worship leader to encourage, to exhort the believers. Now, it's good to become a worship leader, but if my motive becomes I want to be on the stage and everyone should clap for me because the song sounds good and everyone should call me, oh, this good worship leader. Now, how long will that last? It may last for five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. Eventually, when we, the day, you know, he says then verse 13, for the day, the day of judgment, God will say, okay, Paul, come. Now you've been a worship leader for so many years and uh, everyone recognized you as a worship leader. But here's the thing, I'm going to test it by fire. If it's wood, if it's hay, it's only just so that you gain your attention for yourself, it'll burn. But if it's something to glorify God, if it was to glorify Jesus, when I burn it, it will stay. Right? Now, isn't this you know, uh, very, you know, when you think of it, it's like, it's not only encouraging, but it's also scary. Right? Because as believers, we may get caught up in the things that are happening around and we forget that what we are doing must be done for the glory of God. So Paul is saying here, he gives a perfect example. He's saying, uh, later on he talks about the gifts of the Spirit and how you don't have, if you don't have love, it's of no use. But he's building, he's trying to make them understand that whatever you have, if you're bu building it with wood, hay and stubble, it's going to burn. Oh, we are a church. The Corinthian church is known for miracles, signs, wonders, prophetic. When God tests the church or he burns the church with fire, tests it with fire, it's just ashes. Remember in the book of Revelations, what does Jesus say? He says to one of the churches, he says, You have a reputation of being great or being good I, uh, uh, you have a reputation it's just a reputation people say oh this is good wonderful church but i see you as dead so what is important what people think or what god thinks obviously what god thinks right we are not to be motivated by the flesh Right? We do not choose methods that appeal to the flesh. What does Paul say in chapter 2? In the beginning, he said, I come with fear and trembling. I'm not going to talk out of my own knowledge or my own intellectual speech. Did he? Was he intellectual? Very intellectual. But he says, no, no, no. What I want to do is I want to preach the gospel. Good foundation, build on good ground. Right Now, there will be times when we have resorted to carnal methods of reaching out to people or carnal ways of uh, you know, doing ministry. Let's ask God to stop. Stop us or add our track. You know, God is merciful. He's faithful. He's willing to forgive. He's willing to bring us back on track. So we can pray. We say, God, you know, even before you ask of it, it's so beautiful. He knows. Say, God, you know, the last time I preached or I led the worship, I felt I was being led just so that I can led by the by the flesh and not by the Holy Spirit. So please forgive me. Help me to be led by your Holy Spirit. He forgives us. Right? 
we need the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you know, to to do the things out of the spiritual uh, in the spiritual. We need the anointing. Now, in the flesh, if we are trying to do something, we don't need any anointing. Anybody can do it, right? Now, look at people in the world. You know, the great businessmen, great leaders. They don't have the anointing of the Holy Spirit, but they're great. Right? They're doing it out of the flesh. So it's possible to do big things, to do great things, being led by the flesh. Right? But we must make sure that the, that we are building on good ground. Right? Uh, any questions? Any thoughts? Should we continue? No questions? Everything OK? All right. OK, let's continue. OK, verse 16. Now, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. Right? Let's just look at these uh, uh, verses one by one. Right? Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Now, Paul is using this word temple. The Greek word there says naos. Now, now we know now picture this right in the old covenant uh in the tabernacle so you have the outer court the inner court and the most holy place right and the most holy place was when where the high priest would go in and offer the sacrifice right it was it was the skull or the sanctuary of the temple right so only the priest could go there now paul is referring to that he's saying you are the sanctuary Right, you are the place, you are the temple, the sanctuary in the temple where the Holy Spirit dwells in you. Right, so he's trying to paint a picture for them. Right, uh, that you are the temple now, even if they were Gentiles, the Gentiles knew what is the temple, what is the temple, right? There was uh, in Corinth, it was the temple of Aphrodite, right? They knew temple is where God, uh, God's presence is. So he, he's trying to say, hey, you are the temple. That means God's presence is in you. God is in you. He's sitting, he's, he's residing in you. Verse 7, if anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him because the temple is holy. Now the word defile here in Greek means praterio, meaning corrupt, spoil, to ruin, to waste, or to destroy. Now, how can we defile a temple? And when you're talking about our body itself, the temple of God, how can we defile it? Every time I am carnal or I do things out of the flesh, I'm defiling the temple of God. Right? So, so for example, if I have jealousy on somebody, if I'm jealous about somebody, if I have... Uh, you know, I'm angry. I've fought with somebody, and I'm unable to, uh, you know, to uh, give bring forgiveness. Uh, or I, I feel that you know, the, um, just there's so much of pride maybe in my heart. But outside, everything looks nice. I'm showing myself as good. What does it mean? It means I'm being ruled by carnal, immature behavior. Right. And what does that do? That defiles the temple of God. It corrupts, it spoils, it ruins, it wastes, it destroys the temple of God. And he goes on to say, God will destroy him. Right? So here's the question. In what sense and in what way will God destroy those who defile his temple, the local church community? What will God do? 
he will bring a stop. Right now, if you look at the Old Testament, every time there was a certain amount of grace, right? And then God brought a stop. Right? Remember the uh, the prophets in the Old Testament. God sent prophet after prophet to the north uh, of uh, you know Israel to the south of Israel. That is uh, Jew uh, and and prophet after prophet. Then at one point God said, "Enough! I'm not going to send any more people." For four hundred years there was silence. Right, so. God's house must be kept holy. Right? So you are God's house. It must be kept holy. Many a times, now is this easy? It's very, very difficult. But when we try it on our own flesh, we will fail. Right? But when we try it and we ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, you help me. Now let me give you this example. It's happened to me, right? There are many times, you know, we're talking to our friends. Many times when I felt, you know, I just had to, they were talking about somebody and they were talking and then I wanted to say, hey, yeah, you know, what about this person? Many times I've said it, but then I've gone home and, I, and you know, during the prayer time, the Holy Spirit reminds me, you should not have said that. Because you are the temple of God. You you need to be holy. Your words, your thinking need to be holy. I say, God, you know, that moment I said it, Lord, I'm sorry. What to do? But there were many times and people, you know, my good friends or even people in ministry, they've been talking about some other ministry or some other pastor. Many times. I thank God. The Holy Spirit has said, Paul, keep your mouth shut. Walk away from here. I've done it. Just kept quiet. They've called me. Paul, come. We just, you know, we're discussing. I said, no, it's all right. I just need to go. They may have felt offended. They may have thought, oh, what is this? Uh, it's okay. But I was obedient to the Holy Spirit. And what am I doing? I'm keeping my temple clean. I'm keeping the temple of God holy. Holiness is simply staying aligned to who God is expression of his nature in us and through us so there will be that's why that's why there, there will be times you know uh, in our lives we must ask the holy spirit to guide us to remind us many a times right I, I i must have said something and as i'm saying it the holy spirit has said stop don't say that or you say this and, uh, you know you know as a uh, as a pastor in one of the ch in the church, many people come and share their, you know, challenges. Now I may not have gone through those challenges, but I need the Holy Spirit. I say, God, please tell me, give me the right word to say to this person. Right, they're going through problem after problem after problem, and it's been not one month, two months, but it's been years. What can I say to them? Or this couple comes up and says, my my daughter has. Leukemia, cancer. Please pray. What what can we say to them? Right. Uh, we need the Holy Spirit. So, uh, so by depending on the Holy Spirit, we are keeping the temple of God holy. Right. Now, quickly, let's go to verse twenty-one. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things. Are yours. This is powerful, no? Verse 21, Paul is saying, okay, so because of all these reasons, don't boast in man. So our value, our identity uh, is not from any man or woman of God. Right? Everything has been given to us by God, and everything is God's. So everything we do is for him and for the glory of god so we don't derive our value from people or our identity but uh, we've come to a day and age when 
ministry where you know being called pastor or apostle or prophet is is something very fancy right people get uh, demotivated or discouraged when we don't call pastor or prophet and all of that now paul is saying see don't derive your identity from all this titles and uh, you know this man of god did that man of god did you know there are many it, it's sad that to see this uh, very many many people truly believers in christ but they have put so much of their you know identity on the preacher or the pastor you know they just, if he says i will do it if he says you know do this i will do it so this this it's not about what god says it's about what this leader says right and it's not right our identity flows from christ everything that we do must honor him and glorify him right so we see in this chapter one paul is saying we need to be spiritual and we should leave out being carnal learn to be co-workers work together to build god's kingdom very important choose to build with right materials are we going to build with uh, gold silver or precious stones or are we going to build with wood hay and stubble right so we need to choose what we are building on don't go by the outward appearance don't go by the looks but go by what you see uh, by the fruit of the work in ministry right uh, then fourth one understand that we are god's temple um envy strife and division is something that will only defile the temple of god and so we must keep these out and we must always in everything that we do glorify god and not man amen right so this is so true for each one of us that you know we must walk in as well right any questions there's no questions we can take a break and we can come in 10 minutes any questions no questions okay let's take a break we'll come back at uh, 10 o'clock thank you